everyone and welcome back to my channel. I wanted to do a video about some terminology, type 1 diabetes that you may or may not hear, may or may not know. Some of these I've learned within the last year and I've been a type 1 diabetic for almost 31 years. So I thought it would be fun to go over these phrases and words and hopefully teach you something. first one is MDI. You probably hear this one all over the place. I don't know what this one was until just a few years ago and I was MDI for a very long time. <laughs> so MDI stands for multiple daily injections. So as a type 1 diabetic you have to administer insulin in one of two ways. So you either do an injection with a needle and it's manual or you have an insulin pump. Now there's many different pumps and you know many different devices, but those are your pretty much your primary two ways that you can choose. So MDI just means that you choose to manually inject yourself with insulin throughout the day. And that can be with a an insulin pen or a regular syringe and needle. The next one is pre-bolus. I've known this one for a long time, but I only started implementing it as of recent. <laughs> so pre-bolus means that you give yourself insulin for a meal and then you give your body and the insulin time to essentially start working before you eat. So ideally, and again, this could be different for different people depending on your situation. When I was pregnant, I had to pre-bolus about 40 minutes before I ate. Now I do about 15, 20 minutes. So you give yourself the insulin and then I normally set a timer and when that timer goes off, I know that it's okay to start eating. And it doesn't mean you have to eat everything at once, like that is the timer, like you have to eat now. That is just the best time to start eating. And it can also depend on what you're eating. So, you know, fiber, protein, fats, carbs, things like that, the types of carbs, that can also affect how much time you wanna give your body. For a healthy person, once your pancreas releases that insulin, produces that insulin, I think it takes something like under a minute for that insulin to start working. Whereas for us, type ones where we inject that insulin manually, takes about 20 minutes to half an hour. So if we eat and then take our insulin right as we're eating or sometimes even after, that sugar, those carbs, that whatever we're eating is gonna hit our blood sugar way before the insulin does, so you're gonna see that spike, and then once that insulin starts working, you're gonna see that drop. Uh, lows and highs, so if you hear someone talk about, I was high, I was low, we are referring to our blood sugar. So we have a goal set that we wanna be in between. So it is different for different people and how you like your goal set. My pump is set to 80 to 180, so 80 is my low warning and 180 is my high warning. So. Basically, it's when your blood sugar reaches a level that is low for you or high for you. So if you say, I'm low, that means your blood sugar is dropping. For me, I would be anywhere below probably 70. My pump is set to 80 because at that point, my pump will let me know I'm dropping and I can catch that low before it hits like 50 or 45 and I'm on the floor. High is essentially you're over where you like to be. So if you say, I'm, I'm high right now, you know, for me, I, that would be like 180 to 200 and I'd be like, oh, I'm, I'm going high or I feel high or so I need to correct that blood sugar. And that's another one we're going to get into in a second. <laughs> Actually, let's just do it now. So to correct, if you're correcting a low or treating a low, that means that your blood sugar is low and you need to have something with carbs in it to get your blood sugar back to a good steady place. So if your blood sugar is at 40, you say, I need to correct that. I'm gonna eat about 15 to 20 carbs. I'm gonna wait 15 minutes and then kind of see where I'm at from there. If you're correcting a high blood sugar, you're giving yourself insulin. You're giving yourself what's called a correction and that will help bring your blood sugar down. Ideally in that time, you're not eating, you're correcting and you're kind of letting that blood sugar drop. I've heard a lot of people throughout my life say, if you're low, I should give you insulin, right? Absolutely not, 100% no. There is never a situation where if a diabetic is low to give them insulin, it will only make their blood sugar drop and it could result in some pretty, pretty serious circumstances that you do not wanna be in. Long acting insulin and short acting insulin. So these are exactly what their names say. So long acting insulin is normally given once or twice a day 
and that is what's called so called a background insulin and that is called your basal insulin your short acting or quick acting is your bolus so that is the insulin that works quickly and it's out of your system quickly. Rage bolus. <laughs> if you're a type one, you're very familiar with this. Rage bolus is when you have a stubborn, stubborn blood sugar and you just pump yourself full of insulin and probably way too much and then you start to drop and you bottom out. <laughs> so if my blood sugar is consistently like 200, 220, 230 and I'm giving myself insulin, I'm giving myself two units and nothing's going on, another two units, like two hours later, nothing's happening, I'm gonna give myself five units and then I'm gonna regret it. It's really rainy and dark out but it's like 70 degrees so pick your battle I guess. <laughs> Compression low. I just learned this one last year. I had no idea what this was. So if you use a CGM, which we're gonna get into in a minute as well. Uh, well, okay, okay, let's just do that one now. So CGM is a continuous glucose monitor. There are a few different types. There's a Dexcom G6. There's now a Dexcom G7 that is brand new as of this year. A Libre, Medtronic Guardian Center. This sits in your skin. It has a little tiny cannula and it tests your blood sugar every five minutes. If you are on a pump that is in a closed loop system with your CGM, your CGM will send your blood sugar to your pump every five minutes. Your pump will then adjust your insulin as needed. If you do not have a closed loop system, your CGM will still test your blood sugar every five minutes, but it will display it on a different device. Um, it can be on your cell phone on a PDM, which is uh, this little, it kind of looks like a cell phone, it comes with the Dexcom. So there are pumps that don't talk to the Dexcom, they don't talk to each other. I believe the new Omnipod now, the 5 does, but the Dash did not. So you still have this, but they kind of work separately. So you're still working with your pump manually, but you are still seeing your blood sugar and you don't have to finger prick all day long. So following up with CGMs, a compression low is when you are leaning on this, like if I were to lean back like really hard, it usually happens when I have a CGM on my stomach and I'm laying on my stomach, this presses down and it can actually cause your sensor to read a false low. So compression lows are a little scary because usually when you get them, you're laying on your sensor, so you're probably sleeping. It will wake you up screaming at you that your blood sugar is like 35 when it's like 120 which is also bad because at that point, if your blood sugar is so low, your pump will go, uh-oh, we're super low. Let's shut off insulin supply. We're not gonna deliver any insulin. And then because in reality, your blood sugar is not 35 and you are having less insulin being delivered, you can then go high. It's, it's really fun. Insulin pump and insulin. Essentially, the insulin is a hormone that is produced by your pancreas. We do not, as type ones, we do not produce that at all. <laughs> so we have to manually inject it into our bodies to help our bodies function. And an insulin pump is kind of something that does it for us. So you still have to, 178, girlfriend, <laughs> still under 180. <laughs> so this administers the insulin for us. This makes life so much easier, the CGM and the insulin pump correction factor. This is essentially how much insulin is needed to bring you down how many points. Let's say my blood sugar is 250 and I want to bring it down to 200 and let's just make it easy and say that for every 50 points I need one unit of insulin. That is my correction factor. I will give myself one unit of insulin and that will bring me down 50 points. I think my actual correction factor is 33 so I think one unit of insulin will bring me down 33 points. Carb ratio, this is how many units you need per how many carbs. So for me, I for every 12 carbs, I take one unit of insulin. So when we eat, we count our carbs. Let's just say I'm eating 24 carbs. That means I'm gonna get two units of insulin. Oh, hang on, I went over 180. See my pump gave me a little nudge, a little vibrate, vibrate, and I'm gonna do a correction. So my blood sugar is 181. So my pump is currently administering 0.67 units. The sun is coming out. Rebound high. 
So when you have a low blood sugar, your blood sugar is dropping, you are going to correct that with some type of food, snack, drink, juice, candy, Skittles, gummy bears, Kinder Bueno. If you overcorrect, meaning, <laughs> I am the poster child of overcorrecting. If you overcorrect, meaning let's just say you need to eat 15 carbs to get back to a good level and you eat 30, that means you've overcorrected and that high you're gonna get is called a rebound high. So you're dropping, you're dropping, you correct too much and then you rebound high. So then you have to correct that high and that's what we call a roller coaster. <laughs> A1C, your hemoglobin A1C. Not to be confused with hemoglobin, which is your iron levels, which they check your hemoglobin. Um, if you're anemic, you have a low hemoglobin. This is hemoglobin A1C. So this is the three month average of your blood sugars. This is done through a blood draw. That is the most accurate, although now you can do it with just a finger prick. Um, they're pretty accurate. I've tested the CVS brand A1C at home test. Uh, the day before I went to get it done at the lab and it was 0.1% off. It was extremely close. And the way they test that from what I know is there's actually glucose that sticks to your red blood cells and they can actually tell what your blood sugar averages from the amount of glucose that is attached to your red blood cells when they take that blood out of your veins. Should have been a doctor. A site change or a set change. I call it either one. I don't know if there's a difference. I don't know. I've heard it. I've heard it both ways, which is when you are changing your site. Next. I'm just kidding. So the pump that is so gingerly connected to our bodies does have to be changed. The pump itself does not. This is just one entity, but the cartridge that holds the insulin, the tubing, and the part that goes into your body has to be changed every three days maybe four or five or six if you forget, I don't know. So it's important to change that out because you don't want that foreign body to be in your skin. It can cause infection, it can cause irritation. You don't want the site on too long because the tape might cause some type of allergic reaction. So the cartridge, the tubing and all that stuff is that's what it entails in a set change. When you change that because your pump has run out of insulin or it's been three, four days and it's time to change your site. And then you wanna obviously go somewhere else. So you wanna give parts of your body a break. You don't wanna constantly be doing the same spot because you will create a growth of scar tissue. And once scar tissue forms, uh, you really can't do injections there. Uh, you, you can, I mean, physically you can, but because there's scar tissue, the absorption will be bleh. It won't be good absorption. And if you do a CGM, in a spot that has scar tissue, your readings might be off. Something to keep in mind. A naked shower. <laughs> I know what you're thinking, every shower is naked. Not for us. So a naked shower means you are a type one diabetic and you are able to go take a shower without anything on you. Your Dexcom needs to be changed. It has expired. It is time for a set change. You rip everything off and you go take a shower. Dawn phenomenon. Just saying it makes me angry. The dawn phenomenon is that beautiful time in the morning when you wake up, your blood sugar is at 92 and you get up, you start moving around, your blood's going and then your blood sugar starts to just go up on its own. You haven't eaten, you haven't drank anything, but your blood sugar naturally goes up once you're up and about, everything's moving and going and you look down and your blood sugar is at 202. <laughs> that happened to me this morning. I woke up under 100 and then I went to take a shower and I was standing at the sink doing my hair and my blood sugar went up like 50 points just from moving around. Last but certainly not least is DKA. DKA stands for diabetic ketoacidosis essentially means that your blood sugar is so high that your blood is actually becoming acidic. You, at this point, are extremely dehydrated. You probably need to be at the hospital. Uh, I highly recommend not to mess around with that because when it comes to like serious DKA, it happens very quickly. If you guys want to know my DKA story, I'm gonna link that video down below. If you're not getting insulin, your blood sugar is going up and you're in DKA, 
it is it's serious it like I serious as a heart attack serious as DKA eventually it goes high enough to where you do slip into a coma if not treated it absolutely can be fatal so for DKA uh, for me at least in my experience I went to the hospital I had to call 911 I couldn't walk I was throwing up what tasted like just lemon juice like acidic I couldn't keep anything down I couldn't keep down water I couldn't couldn't even think about food went to the hospital and at that point they will give you insulin through an IV to get your blood sugar down as quickly as possible DKA is extremely serious it happens very quickly I mean within hours you're in DKA it's hours and it's something that it's good to know the symptoms of DKA, especially if you live with someone or you're close with someone who has diabetes. Um, and for yourself as well, if you're a diabetic, it's really important to know the symptoms because I, I mean, I, I had DKA five years ago now, which was the first time I ever had it after being diagnosed. And I didn't really know the symptoms. I didn't understand what was going on. I thought I had sunstroke. I was throwing up. I felt so weak. I felt like I couldn't get enough water. And don't ask me why I didn't think, huh, Carolina, check your blood sugar, dumb, dumb. But for some, I don't know. Like, you know, when you look back and you're like, wow, <laughs> that was one of those moments. I don't know if my sensor was off. Something was going on where I didn't have my sensor on and I checked my blood sugar and I was at like 400 and I was like, oh man, I need insulin. So I gave myself insulin, didn't think twice about it. That insulin didn't go through because my cannula was kinked, which means that my infusion site when the introducer needle came out of my body, it also took the cannula with it and it looked like this. So there was no longer anything being administered, all the insulin was going back out. So I could have given myself all the insulin in the world and it would not, would not have done anything. So extremely serious and a great place to end the video. <laughs> so have a great weekend, have a great week, have a great night. I love you guys so much, I'll see you in the next one, bye.